At this weekend's G7 summit meeting in Washington, finance ministers and other central bankers expressed their concern about the strength of the yen. It's a rather blunt statement, particularly as they've mentioned a specific currency. London has both the good and the bad to offer the South African business community this week. The good news is, is that Old Mutual has entered the FTSE 100. Entry into the top 100 companies in Britain means that Old Mutual will raise its profile internationally. Plus, it also means that index tracking funds will buy into the share, which is certainly good news for the share price in the short term. At Anglo headquarters, you wouldn't know this was such a big day. In fact, the sign behind me is tiny, and we had to really look to find their offices. Now, for the launch of Anglo-American in London, there's just been one press release. I have it in my hand. It doesn't give away too much more information, although we've just heard about the surprise news of more shares being released. But there's no grand lunches, no red carpet at the stock exchange, and definitely no big media or analyst parties. With the war in Kosovo showing no signs of letting up, the use of ground forces by NATO becomes a distinct possibility. In the meantime, the markets have had mixed fortunes over the last few days. On Monday, the FTSE in London hit a record high. And that was shortly followed by upward movements in Paris and Frankfurt. But America sets the rule of thumb. So if the Dow goes into reversal, you can bet your bottom dollar that London will do the same. And sure it did on Tuesday, nearly dropping 200 points. That was a decline of 3%. So the markets and the Balkans remain a very dangerous place at the moment. If you think a year in politics is a long time, a week in gold is an eternity. We just digest the news of the second gold auction by the British government, when overnight we had the announcement by the European Central Banks of the five-year moratorium on gold sales. That had a major impact on the price of gold, pushing it above the psychological barrier of $300 a troy ounce. So I decided to speak to Karen St. Jean Couffour, the commodities editor with the Economist Intelligence Unit, to find out what she thinks about all of this. The world of aluminium hasn't seen so much excitement since 1958, when two American titans, Alcoa and Reynolds, fought the mother of all battles for British aluminium, with Reynolds coming out on top. Goodyear Tire and Rubber has announced the largest ever industrial deal by an American company in Japan. It will form an alliance with a Japanese tire maker, Sumitomo. Goodyear will run operations in the US and Europe, while Sumitomo will manage the Asian business. Last week, some 41 years later, it was announced that Alcan, Pechini and Ali Suisse were merging into a group with the inspirational title of APA, and they expect a market capitalization of $19 billion which is within spitting distance of the world's number one, Alcoa. Well, the late 1990s has been the era of the central bank. In the US, the Fed Reserve Chairman, Alan Greenspan, has become a national institution. Every word he mutters is actually studied by all the investors around the world. And the recent rise in interest rates, although predicted by many analysts, still made them rather anxious the day before. Well, in the aftermath of the interest rate decision, I'm here at Chase Manhattan in London, and I'm joined by Hans Radeker. Confused? I sure am. So I went to seek out the opinion of Nigel Kaiser, who is the mining and metals analyst with JP Morgan. Nigel, aluminium, I really don't know where to begin, but last week the aluminium industry went completely crazy. And that's an understatement with all sorts of announcements, merger plans, acquisitions. But let's first of all start by looking at the three-way proposed merger between Alcan of Canada, Pechini of France and Ali Suisse of Switzerland. Do you think the menage a trois will ever be consummated? The Fed Reserve is sitting midweek like a large troll, ready to gobble up the imprudent or the careless. Hence, with the exception of a few bargain hunters, most investors are waiting to see what intentions the Fed are going to make over interest rates. So most of the analysts I spoke to still believe that emerging markets are a relatively good bet to put your money in. But that could all change, what with Japan and the yen getting stronger all the time. And if the yen does go around the 110 mark against the dollar, then really America and Japan have got to join forces to make sure that the worldwide economies don't ground to a massive halt. The other story has it that there's an even bigger deal in the offing. Apparently there could be talks going on between Danone, who make Cronenberg, and SA Breweries. So what would happen to the company? Would they lose their independence, lose their listing on the stock exchange? And could Danone be the majority shareholder? 
The fourth Rugby World Cup is apparently the third largest sporting event in the world behind the Olympics and also the Football World Cup, or soccer as you may like to call it. Now by the time the final is played on November the 6th, 41 games have been played and over 2 million people have attended those games, watched by a staggering huge 3.5 billion people worldwide in 150 countries, and apparently over 4,000 journalists will be reporting on the event. And one of those journalists joins me now. It's Patrick Harbison from the FT. Now, Patrick, the profile of the World Cup, it hasn't been great so far. It's been relegated to the sidelines. Things like the Ryder Cup has taken precedence over it, and also the Champions League in Europe and even the Davis Tennis Cup as well. What's been going on? The results were much better than they expected. That was partly due to the fact that commodity prices have been low over the last year. But both companies have done very, very well in raising their international profile. In particular, Billiton has been the darling of the market. It's been the best performing share in the first six months this year in the FTSE 100. It's the carnival of resistance. Yesterday, protesters apparently all around the world are protesting against corporate greed and capitalism. Now, this is an inscribed diamond. Honestly, it's worth between fifteen to $20,000. I'm very worried about handling it. And apparently it's inscribed with the mark of De Beers and the year 2000. Now, I can't see it. It's not visible to the human naked eye. But apparently by using this machine here, so if I plonk it down, Derek, mm -hmm. you reckon you can prove to me that this is a limited edition diamond. How are you going to do it? To discuss some of the important questions raised by that report, I'm now joined by someone whose experience and understanding of the issues confronting you today is second to none. Michael Rice is Managing Director of the Consultancy Actuary Practice within Phillips Fox. You mentioned about going to an advisor. How can I actually trust that person? That still leaves me with a burning issue. Is the advice right? Is it good for me? So Alcoa may still be the world's number one, but the APA Alliance did a pretty good job at coming a close second. Added to the fact that Alcan of Canada have already put in place a really good deal with General Motors supplying aluminium to the car industry. I don't think cost-cutting is going to be a major feature over the coming months because many corners have still been cut. And we'll look at aluminium in just a second. But in your statement, you say we retain a significant financial capacity to pursue potential opportunities. That's an intriguing statement. What do you actually mean by that? The rag and bone man carrying scrap to Downing Street is a reference to the old British TV sitcom Stepton and Son reflecting the council's poor opinion of Chancellor Gordon Brown as little more than a penny-pinching scrap metal dealer ready to sell off the nation's gold at a knockdown price. In addition, we'll be evaluating some specific extra courser offers through direct mail. Some will be offered Shoreguard warranty. Others will be given vouchers cutting £300 off the purchase price. Now, only a few specially targeted customers will receive these offers. The decision to move has not made Mike Levitt universally popular in South Africa. One director even resigned over the demutualization issue. Now, their plea is actually falling on deaf ears. Tony Blair, the Prime Minister of Britain, has refused to put a halt to the sales and has even refused to meet the delegation. Patricia Hewitt said to the Treasury Select Committee that the sale would go ahead. Last year, the health of the emerging markets was poor. The Russians had defaulted and the Asian economies had never heard of the word restructuring. Well, a year on, things are very different. The emerging markets' equity markets have been the best performing so far. But can this continue? But in other ways, the signs are not good. One disturbing development this week was the whispers of a Chinese devaluation, firmly back on the agenda. Now, the reason for this is the lack of key economic data. South African mining giants Anglo-American are trying to convince investors that it's changing its company at a rapid pace. And it's launched an advertising campaign which reads something like this. Platinum from the Bushveld complex in South Africa produced by geological change over two billion years ago. By comparison, we're changing rather rapidly. Well, I do hope so, because the London listing takes place on May the 24th. They're changing their listing from Johannesburg to London. And Julian Ogilvy Thompson has been here in town trying to convince those investors that it is a company that they should invest when it's launched on May the 24th.